AMD is launching their new 7000 series graphics cards this December, and we've got our hands on both the 7900 XTX and the 7900 XT. But how do they stack up against the current industry leader? Let's check it out. Thanks for watching 9to5toys. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell to enable notifications so you don't miss any upcoming videos. With the release of these cards, everyone's going to be talking about the elephant in the room that may or may not spontaneously combust. Needless to say, we're at an interesting point in the graphics card space, with Intel coming onto the scene and costs rising to the point where you can build a decent rig for the price of one of these GPUs. A lot of people have been soured by Nvidia's anti-consumer practices for years now, but will it ever have a noticeable effect on market share? Now, AMD knows that it has no answer to the $1600 RTX 4090, but at that price, you can buy a cheaper but still expensive card and the rest of your rig and make out pretty well. What they are comparing it to in their internal testing is the 4080, which retails for $1,200. Now, I don't have one with me, but the size difference between the 4080 and the XTX and XT is staggering. If you need a smaller form factor in your case and you really want a flagship, this is definitely the card to go with. That makes the performance all the more impressive. First off, we have to acknowledge that these are just beautiful cards. They look great in your PC, and I love how sleek this cooler design is. They take up 2.5 slots in your PC, as you can see here, and the XTX is slightly taller and longer than the XT, but both are significantly smaller than the 4080. Honestly, I value modularity, and I dislike building my entire system around one component, so I'm thankful that they went this route. Seriously, a volume of 1800 cubic centimeters is much preferred compared to over 2500 cubic centimeters, especially when considering the fact that the 4080 has less of a power draw than the XTX. It also requires a dual 8-pin power connector rather than a 12-pin. On the XTX and XT, we're looking at one HDMI 2.1, one USB-C, and two DisplayPort 2.1 inputs, which have ultra-high bitrate 13.5, or UHBR, capabilities. That means you can get 54 gigabytes per second bandwidth as opposed to UHBR10, which maxes out at 40 gigabytes per second. UHBR10 is meant to handle a single display at 4K 144Hz or 8K 30Hz, and UHBR 13.5 advertises 8K 60Hz, which is way overkill than any gamer needs right now. Seriously, we won't even have displays that can handle this until next year. And while the 4090 uses DisplayPort 1.4a, I would absolutely not base your buying decision on this factor. The 7900 XTX has 24GB of DDR6 memory and the XT has 20GB, powered by 355 watts and 300 to 315 watts respectively. That means in your build, AMD recommends an 800 watt or 750 watt minimum power supply. That's around what people recommend for the 4080, but as always, it's how you use the power that matters. An interesting note, the previous flagship card from AMD, the RX 6950XT, ran at a typical board power of 335 watts. The 7900 XT runs at 315 watts, so not only are you getting massive performance improvements, you're also getting it for less power requirements, which drives home just how much AMD is focused on improving not just performance, but performance per watt. Performance per watt and performance per dollar are the two key ingredients that make these cards stand out. To help with performance and power, AMD went with a chiplet design, the first GPU to make use of this architecture. They actually have two separate dies that are connected through a 5.3 terabyte per second interconnect. This also means they can run at decoupled clock speeds. So on the 7900 XTX, they can run shaders at 2.3 gigahertz and the front end at 2.5 gigahertz taking the load off where it matters. When choosing a graphics card beyond hardware compatibility, as a budget gamer, my decision comes down to performance per dollar. What's the value for my money? While the 4080 may beat the 7900 XT in most games, it's kind of a toss up between the 4080 and the XTX and others. So when you break it down by cost, things start to get a little more clear. For example, let's look at Cyberpunk 2077, Resident Evil Village, and Sniper Elite 5. Keep in mind that these are AMD's numbers and at 4K resolution. For Cyberpunk, the 4080 runs 4K at 65 FPS, the 7900 XT at 60 FPS, and the XTX can get up to 71 FPS. Resident Evil Village has the 4080 at 164 FPS, XT at 154 FPS, 
and the XTX at 187 FPS. In Sniper Elite 5, the 4080 can run it at 126 FPS, XT at 107 FPS, and XTX at 121 FPS. So when you break those numbers down into performance per dollar, things become a little more impressive. Remember, you're paying 200 extra dollars for the 4080 versus the 7900 XTX. So even in games like Sniper Elite 5, where the 4080 performs marginally better, the 7900 XTX is still better overall value for what you're paying for. With that, let's get into real performance. The build I'm working with includes the Ryzen 9 7950X CPU, 32GB of DDR5 memory, and an X670E motherboard. The games are also running on a Samsung 990 Pro 2TB SSD, which I recently reviewed, and my monitor is 4K 60Hz, which is basically my limit without getting into $500, $600 range. If you value frame rates above 60, I highly recommend going for a 1440p monitor instead, as those give you much more bang for your buck in that department. After a disastrous launch two years ago, Cyberpunk 2077 is in a decent state right now. I have about 25 hours and only experienced two game-breaking bugs so far, so it's stable enough that I was comfortable to use it for testing. At 4K native resolution, it averages around what AMD advertised, just above 70 FPS, with dips that get down into the mid-50s for more graphically intense areas. I've been playing this mostly at a capped FPS of 60, and it's been impressively consistent with frame rate throughout. As for Doom Eternal, it averages around 150 FPS, but it did get up to 180 at points, and Halo Infinite was very consistent in the 80 FPS range. As for ray tracing, if you're shooting for a consistent 60 FPS on ultra ray tracing settings, FSR is the only way you'll get close. Without it, you're looking at FPS in the teens and 20s. If you use FSR in one of the quality settings, 40 is possible. Unfortunately, I could not get a 60 FPS on ultra performance. Instead, it averages in the mid to high 50s. Now, if you're just going for a stroll in Night City and you cap your frame rate, it hits 60 far more often than in the middle of combat. 100% of the time, I would sacrifice boosting ray tracing quality in favor of a consistent FPS. So, in pursuit of that, I found the sweet spot to be setting ray tracing to medium, then going in and changing ray trace lighting to psycho, and keeping ray trace reflections off. Obviously, while nice to have, ray trace reflections are the real performance killer here. Of course, there are tweaks to squeeze better performance out of these games, but as someone who only has a monitor that can do 4K60, I'm more than happy with these results. Now, as you probably know, raw performance doesn't always give you the full picture. Different manufacturers have their own proprietary or open software capabilities to round out their offerings. With NVIDIA, you know you're getting top of the line ray tracing in your games, but AMD is making strides, and when you break it down performance per dollar, they are catching up. Raw ray tracing performance though, not quite. They also each have their own upscaling features, which allow you to run the game at a lower resolution than your monitor and have the software upscale it to your native resolution, essentially giving you free FPS. This is known as NVIDIA's DLSS and AMD's Fidelity FX Super Resolution, also known as FSR, which has two iterations so far. FSR1 offers massive performance improvements at the cost of not great image quality. And while FSR2 does improve image quality, it's really not comparable with DLSS due to the fact that NVIDIA uses AI upscaling, which is far ahead of FSR2. Also, DLSS has been around longer and is supported in more games, but is also exclusively available on NVIDIA cards. FSR can be used on any card and is even available in the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S. AMD says that it's supported in 226 games and upcoming releases, including unannounced games, but only lists support in 54 available games at the time of making this video. DLSS will be the clear winner in upscaling for the time being without a doubt. AMD's other offerings include the cloud gaming service AMD Link, smart technology that boosts your performance if you're using a Ryzen CPU and a Radeon card, and AMD HyperRX, which combines Radeon Super Resolution, Boost, and Anti-Lag, coming in the first half of 2023. It'll be automatically integrated with select games, and they're saying you'll get one-click performance and latency boost. We'll definitely have to keep our eyes peeled for that one. All in all, AMD may not be taking shots at the 4090 King, but when you factor in the lower requirements to run it, smaller form factor, less power requirements, 
they might just be the path of least resistance when it comes to upgrading or building an entirely new system. When it comes to how these will fare practically in the market, looking at Steam's hardware survey, less than 3% of people are running games at 4K, and only around 11% are at 1440p. Compare that to the 65% running at 1080p, these cards will be overkill for a lot of those in the market for an upgrade. And the 1440p results on competitive games like Valorant, Rainbow Six Siege, and Overwatch 2 easily rival the more expensive competitors. That being said, Nvidia still dominates market share and we won't see that change for the next couple of years, at least until the prices come down. With a lot of enthusiasts expressing frustration at Nvidia for their pricing, especially in the crater that is the crypto crash, AMD had a golden opportunity to strike. While they can't compete with things like ray tracing or DLSS or integration with software for creators and especially streamers, they are making significant steps towards meeting that standard. This is especially important when previous iterations were mostly lackluster in comparison, and they needed to take a significant leap over the last generation, and they absolutely did. The real star is the fact that the value you get for your money is better than anything on the market, but that monetary cost is still prohibitively expensive. The Radeon RX 7900 XTX retails for $999 and the 7900 XT is $899 and they'll be available December 13th, 2022. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, leave us a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you want more videos like this. This is Dom with 9to5toys.